At first, I thought my garden was only gonna impact just a couple people. But then once I finally like saw what it was doing, I'm like, okay, I want to keep going because this is this feels really good. Like I love helping people. Welcome back to Funeral Potatoes and Wool Mittens, a show for people who embrace the warm and cozy spirit of everyday living in the Midwest. From the blog Random Sweets, I'm your host, Stacy Mergenthal. Today we're heading to rural Dixon, Iowa to meet Lauren Schrader and her mom, Katie, on their family farm, and Lauren's FFA advisor and ag teacher, Jenna Kingsley. Lauren's a junior at Calamus Wheatland High School. She shows sheep and rabbits at county fairs, plays softball and volleyball. She's the junior class president. And somehow, Lauren, who is a three-time national FFA grant recipient and a My Impact Challenge special award winner, has found time to grow more than $15,300 in retail value of fruits and vegetables over the past two summers and donate them all to local nonprofits. Having already donated more than 7,000 pounds from her bounty of 25 different crops, Lauren will triple, triple her, her impact when she meets her goal of expanding to two acres and growing and donating a total of 20,000 pounds of fresh produce to at least 10 organizations by the end of her community service project, which will be in the summer of 2025, just before she heads off to college. <laughs> we have a lot to talk about, like, where in the world did Lauren come up with this idea? How many green beans has she donated? And how, how does she like to cook them at home? Why she's watering all of this by hand with watering, watering cans? How Jenna sees Lauren's project inspiring others? And what impact her generous bounties have had on communities? Her mom, Katie, shares her recipe for homemade spaghetti sauce. How Lauren gives with the goodness of her heart and a heartwarming story about the time she saw firsthand how the fresh produce affected a mom and her children at a domestic violence shelter. So while you're listening, go to randomsweets.com to see the photos of Lauren with all her bounties. It's mind-blowing! And I've also posted their green beans and spaghetti sauce recipes there. Lauren, Katie, and Jenna, welcome to Funeral Potatoes and Wool Mittens. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. I am excited for the three of you to share Lauren's story. <laughs> Takes three of you to share the story <laughs> <laughs> about her idea for growing a garden and donating the bounty to local nonprofits and the impact that it's had. And in addition to your overall story, I also love that you're my first, first guest from Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> I can't perfect. think of a better way. Yeah, perfect. I can't think of a better way to represent one of the most midwesternly identified states, right? <laughs> yeah, we don't grow corn in this garden, but yeah, about everything else. <laughs> Lauren, do you want to start? You're the star of the show. <laughs> yeah, I can. So I'm Lauren Trader. I'm a 17 year old junior from Camas Sweetland High School. I live on a farm outside of Dixon, Iowa. On that farm, I have sheep and rabbits that I show at the county fairs. In school, I'm involved in softball, volleyball, NHS, student council, junior class president, and that's about it. <laughs> that's about it. That's a <laughs> long list. <laughs> yeah. I'll go next. So I'm Katie Schrader and I'm Lauren's mom. Um, like she said, we live by Dixon, Iowa. So it's a small town kind of close to the border of Illinois. Um, I'm born and raised here. We actually live about two miles from where I grew up. Um, husband's from this area as well. And we have three other kids. Lauren is the oldest of all four. Awesome. Uh, so I am Jenna Kingsley. I am Lauren's um, FFA advisor and ag teacher here at Calma Sweetland High School. Uh, this is my third year here. So I've had Lauren since she was a freshman. Were you an FFA when you were in school or? I, yes, I was. So I'm actually originally from Michigan. Um, mm. I was active in 4-H and FFA in Michigan. Um, I was a state officer my freshman year of college in Michigan. Um, and then I transferred um, out to Iowa State my junior year of college. Um, so I did two and a half years at Iowa State, um, decided I loved Iowa so much and still here today. Okay. So I want to hear the story behind everything here. But first, 
I want Jenna, if you would just take just a minute to, because we're talking about an FFA project is kind of how all of this started. I can't imagine somebody who lives in the Midwest that they wouldn't know what FFA is, but if you just want to explain a little bit about what FFA is. Yeah. I mean, you'd be surprised. A lot of people, I think the most common agriculture organization they probably know of more is 4-H just because with some of the younger kids too, they get started earlier. Um, But I would say FFA and 4-H are very, very similar in their type and kinds. FFA Uh, when it was first started in 1928, was obviously what most people think of it as today as the Future Farmers of America organization. Since then, we've kind of evolved and changed in the sense that we wanted people that were in the organization to realize that it was much more than just farming and agriculture. So we don't go by the name Future Farmers of America anymore. It is just simply uh, the National FFA organization in order to be more inclusive um, and inviting, just saying, you know, Lauren's probably not going to grow up and be a farmer and have a thousand acres or whatever, but Lauren is still able to be an FFA um, inside of that. FFA as a whole is an intracurricular organization, and it's a part of the three circle model with agricultural education. So when we break down agricultural education, we break it into three different parts. We have classroom instruction. So that's when kids are here in an ag class with me. Um, We have their supervised agriculture experience, and this is what Lauren, her project is about. It's her supervised agriculture experience. So it's a way that kids are involved in agriculture, um, and then I kind of oversee it as their teacher and advisor. Um, And then we have the FFA side of it, which is more of the leadership organization within FFA. So a lot of it, like I said, is a leadership organization that enhances the agriculture education classroom setting. I want to hear from you, Lauren. How how did this come about? How'd you come up with the idea to grow a garden and donate your bounty? So during COVID back in 2020, when that would have been where I would be thinking about my SAE, I started packing boxes of produce at Community Action of Eastern Iowa in Davenport. So I got to see what all was inside the boxes, like cereal, toothbrushes, toothpaste, but there was no produce that I would put in the boxes which concerned me a little bit because you need that in your daily lives. So I talked to my mom about it. I said, hey, I want to start a garden through my SAE because at Cali, it's a big goal to set your SAE your freshman year. So everyone that's an FFA at Cali has their SAE planned out. So I wanted something different than everyone else that would still impact the community, but also help me with my leadership because as an essay, you need to improve your leadership skills, improve just everything throughout the years. What is the, are you saying SAE? Yeah, your supervised agriculture experience. Okay, okay. So, so Jenna, you were talking about yeah, that there. It's that, that third part of the um, agriculture education model. And again, it's just a way that kids are getting hands-on opportunities um, to be directly involved in agriculture. So a lot of it, somebody who grows up on a farm or shows cattle at the county fair or state fair, um, that is their supervised agriculture experience, or they can work at Tyson's, or they can work in an ag- in an ag related field, or raising animals. Lawrence just happens to fall kind of dual. She has two different sides to it. She has that community mm. service aspect of it, and she also has the vegetable production aspect of it. Were there? I think I read something about some grants, some FFA grants. Did those help with this project? Yeah. So over the past two years, so freshman and sophomore year. I was awarded a $1,000 SAE grant, so I had to fill out an application through the National FFA. There, they pick the top people to get this SAE, and so that was me. So this helped support my garden for the past two years. So I'm currently filling out an SAE, a $5,000 application, which is new this year that they're starting. So I'm hoping to get it, but if not, that's okay, too. $1,000 $1,000 can be like a default. Yeah. I'm going to tell you as a parent that helped tremendously. <laughs> so, I can imagine. Oh my gosh. I mean, just this past year, just kind of thinking about the, the seeds and plants alone cost about $550 just in last year's garden. So, I mean, that's how many were planted and whatnot. So that $1,000 grant through the National FFA organization is just huge and helps kids like Lauren just really get a jump start or really expand their SAEs and super helpful. It sounds to me like you're probably able to do things that you wouldn't have normally been able to do if you didn't have some of these grants available. So that's pretty important, makes an impact as well. Mm-hmm. So let's walk through that. I mean, you're like, hey... <laughs> These people aren't getting fresh fruits and vegetables. Moms, I want to grow. I mean, 
Katie, what did you think when she said this to you? Well, I, uh, I came at it two different ways, I think. So first, like, how could you not be proud? I know I've said that multiple, um, press organizations, but I'm like, how could you not be proud that she wanted to learn about agronomy? She wanted to learn about gardening, you know, all of the aspects related to ag, but you're going to kick it up a notch and you're going to donate to local nonprofits. So again, how could you not be proud? And then Mm -hmm. my mind quickly went to reality a little bit, like, okay, where's this going to be? Um, how are we going to get a fence put up? Like, you know, I don't really know everything about gardening. I know the basics, but you know, so uh, I had a little bit of that moment happen too, but in the end, I think the truly the goodness of her heart and her willingness to put the work in, I know Lauren would do that. So I never doubted that for one minute that she would be hardworking and do it. That kind of outweighed my doubts. So away we went (laughs) two years ago. (laughs) Did you already have a garden at home? Yeah, just it was just a small garden, like a very small garden. Just enough to feed your family. I mean, it wasn't for the whole whole neighborhood or anything. (laughs) (laughs) No, we're fortunate enough that, again, Eastern Iowa, we've got really awesome ground here in Scott County, Iowa. And so the garden's actually located a half mile from our house. So we have, have enough area just in, it was actually, I think it was corn at that point you know, tilled everything up two years ago, I think around April timeframe and converted just, you know, the, the ground that was being used for corn and soybeans to this plot for her. And how big is the plot? Right now it's an acre in the okay. future. And then next year I'm going to expand to one and a half acre. And then the year after that will be two acres. So in total, I will be growing two acres. So you're planning two two years ahead, 2024 yes. and 2025. Yeah. And you'll be a senior next year. So yes. you're talking about your, your summer between your junior, senior year, and then the summer out after your senior year. Yes. Okay. Where did you buy your seeds? How did you decide what you're going to plant? What thought went into the vegetables that you were going to grow? what kind of soil you have, how are you going to water out there if it's a half a mile from your house? So firstly, I started planning out my garden in February, just a rough sketch of where everything would go. Um, Like every single year I've done that because each year once you plant something, you have to rotate the vegetables in order to not cause any spreading or like diseases throughout the plants if you keep planting them in one spot. Then in March, I started buying the produce online just because it was cheaper that way and there was more variety of vegetables online. And then the ones that I wanted in person, I would go to Farm and Fleet and get them like lettuce and broccoli and all that good stuff just because it was already a plant and not a seed and it would be easier to grow in the ground. Mm-hmm. Mid-May, I, I, mid-May, I started growing everything except for the potatoes I would plant the potatoes in April because they take longer to grow and then I would harvest them later than everything else just because they weren't ready. Sure. Yeah. And then watering was yeah. tricky. Watering I have <laughs> watering I have a ranger where I have two tanks full of water that I have to haul down there every single day. And then once I got there, I would have watering cans that so there's a little spigot on the um tanks that you would just open up and then water would come out. So I'd have watering cans and then I'd walk around my whole garden and then I'd water everything by hand. And that easily took two to three hours every single day. So it was very time consuming. I think last year was, last year was a little bit easier because we had a lot of rain in Iowa in the summer, but this past summer we borderline drought Mm -hmm. quite a bit. So, I mean, if you're talking the magnitude of the amount of water each one of these tanks holds like 35 gallons and she would come back and refill so on a daily basis she was watering probably 100 gallons each day so she's not over exaggerating when she said two or three hours per day it was very manual and it's just because we deal with those you know fun things in the midwest here and there so Mm -hmm. And all by hand, I can't believe that you didn't have like a, you know, spray your hose off the tank or something, but 
Yeah. Her dad wanted to do that. And Lauren said, no, I'm just going to point that out. Yeah. <laughs> Lauren, what are you thinking? <laughs> it was like, it was a smaller like hose and it just took way longer than it needed to. And I just got oh. impatient and wanted to do it myself. So <laughs> you, you talk about improvements for next year. That is it's gotta happen or it's gotta rain or something because that was not rain. fun right yeah <laughs> so what about pest control you said something about a fence of course I live out in the country and I know how the deer are and rabbits and things so did you do something to kind of help control that yeah so the fence came up and then once the fence part was in the ground um, I would take the skid steer and push everything up to the fence so that like rabbits couldn't dig underneath of it. Oh, mm-hmm. um, for like bugs and stuff like that, I would have this black fabric that I'd lay on the bottom, and then so they couldn't get to the produce, it like and okay. stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. We never yeah. had any, although it, it worried us. I think uh, we never had any critters. Uh, I know whenever we go down there and take a look around, you could see the deer came right up to this fence. It's just a really cheap, cheaply done one, honestly, but it was really effective. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I, these are the things that keep me up at night too. So like you see <laughs> the deer tracks, but again, never once bothered it. So we've been very fortunate the past two years, never had any issues and no major pests have wiped anything out either. So again, doing something right. So Jenna, you're you're her advisor. Do you go out and check this garden every once in a while or? So I've actually never been out to their garden. Uh, a lot of my role sits obviously more in the classroom and in the FFA side of it with her. As I am kind of, I am a supervisor of her project, but a lot of the assistance that I help Lauren with, especially when it comes to like writing grants um, and kind of dealing with some of these publicity things too, um, which we've, has been a new, a new endeavor in the last few weeks <laughs> of uh, how much attention this project has gotten. Jenna, why do you think that this project has gotten so much attention? Because that's how I found out about it was there was some news article somewhere. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding. This girl's in high school. How cool. And I mean, I think exactly what you just said. She's in high school and she's donating thousands of pounds to nonprofits and it's community Mm -hmm. service. There's no, it's not like, it's not like she's selling these in downtown Davenport or selling these (laughs) down over in DeWitt. She's donating them to those, those local areas. And it's not just those in the Quad Cities, because obviously we're we're 45 minutes from the Quad Cities. So it's not that, you know, all of her produce is going those 45 minutes away. She's also doing things right here in our community and at the assistance centers in Calmus and Wheatland too. So Lauren, go back to your garden. Now things are growing. How do you store everything or do you, do you store anything or are you, you're making it so that when you're, once you're picking everything, you're delivering it right away? So I would pick the produce that would be ready. And then I would go back to my house and I'd this small scale that I would weigh everything out on. So like mm. I'd weigh out the bell peppers, I'd weigh out the tomatoes, stuff like that. And then once they were done, I have these little boxes with stickers on them that say High Rock Farms because so that everyone knows that it's from me. And then I would put the produce that I want to go to this organization in this box. Like some things were different just based on the needs of where they were. Like for Cafe and Vine in Davenport, they need more produce because there's just more people there in general and then they're, they're in a lower income place so that was one compared to like the Carroll system center where it was just in town where you didn't need as much because it was a smaller community yeah so we didn't, we didn't really store anything so yeah. like you said I mean after she would weigh things I think the most we kept produce at the house is maybe a day or if it's on the weekend some places weren't open so maybe two days at the most so it, it goes right away so you talk about fresh it's delivered fresh right away and luckily she's 17 so has her driver's license in Iowa because that would be really hard if she didn't so right so what what vegetables have you donated we have a full list yeah we'll, we'll give you a, a flavor here I, okay I'll, I'll just say all of them so I have basil, bell peppers, broccoli, cabbage, carrots, cauliflower, cherry tomatoes, cucumbers, eggplants, green beans, jalapenos, lettuce, oregano, peas, peppermint, potatoes, pumpkin gourds, rosemary, squash, zucchini, strawberries, sweet potatoes, thyme, and regular tomatoes. So I think I counted 24, 24, 25. I might've missed one of them. 
she basically i should have said lauren what aren't you growing <laughs> oh, she did miss <clears throat> oh, yeah. onions and so carrots I, I that. no you said carrots i did yeah yeah just so there's at least 25 different things yeah. that you're throwing there. Do you know what the dollar value is of what you've donated? For 2023, it was $9,483.40. And then what was 2022? 2022 was $5,840.93. So if we add it together, it's about $15,324. In two and years' actually- time. Yeah, it's actually pretty cool um, how she does keep track of it. And Lauren, I'll let you jump in a little bit too. But in in FFA land, we'll call it, um, we have a record keeping system called the Agriculture Experience Tracker. Um, and we just shorten that to AET. So there's a record keeping system where she actually enters in and she has a spreadsheet that it corresponds with. And in her spreadsheet, she takes how many pounds she donates each time she goes to a place, how many pounds of that produce. She takes the market value of that times those together does some magical math and it gives that dollar amount that that dollar amount or what the what the retail value is and then how many pounds or if it's an onion like one onion quantity wise um and kind of does that math and then in the record keeping system the AET she actually puts it in there as well so it's just kind of a second place so when we run applications and record books for this project it's kind of a compilation of all the different areas and it gives what time or what day it was she puts in what place it went to so she has records of every single place she's donated to how much and all of that so the record keeping part of it is very very extensive as far as like big quantities and big pounds i we took a stab at putting together some stats here so i'll let Lauren, kind of give you those. It's kind of cool. Okay. For over the two years, I have 4,509 cherry tomatoes, 19,669 green beans, 5,651 peas, 92 heads of cauliflower, cabbage, and broccoli, and 3,191 tomatoes, including just the large ones. That's incredible. I mean, did you keeping (laughs) ecstatic? Right. Yeah. And then like some pounds too. I mean, again, some of these are pretty cool. You don't have to read them all, but I mean, throw out some cool stats for pounds. Um, I'll read for tomatoes, I have 1,165 pounds. Uh for pumpkins and gourds, I have 2,407. For potatoes, I have 300. 87 pounds and then just one more I have nine 973 pounds of zucchini oh jeez that makes a lot of meals (laughs) it does (laughs) and and now you probably have some muscles to show it right (laughs) all that physical labor (laughs) yeah yeah I I think um one cool stat just kind of as you think about how many meals and whatnot so I know Lauren mentioned 1,165 pounds of tomatoes. So mm-hmm. for our family, I use four pounds in a batch of spaghetti sauce. So if you do the math, that equates to 291 batches of spaghetti sauce just in the tomatoes alone that she's produced. Oh, so, wow, I just got right. goosebumps. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of meal. <laughs> So which, which organizations did you donate to? Have you donated to? So over the past two years, I've donated to a Lost Nation Food Pantry, the Carroll Assistance Center in Wheatland, Iowa, the River Bend Food Bank in um, Davenport, Community Action of Eastern Iowa in Davenport, the Wheatland Nursing Home, Cafe on Vine in Davenport, Family Resources in Davenport and Lady of the Prairie in Wheeland. What is their what's their reaction been to your donations? They've been extremely grateful, especially Cafe Online, because not many people donate there. And, and well, I've been the first to donate such a large portion of produce to them, and they automatically take it in and then they can everything so they can use oh. it throughout the winter. So that's why I've been like pushing to get more to them because they save it. They don't just spend it all at one time compared to other places. Mm -hmm. One of the really cool memorable stories, and it actually makes me kind of emotional thinking about it was last year, family resources is like women's shelter. And 
So in, usually when you go donate, you meet a staff member, you know, typically every time. So mm -hmm. I went with Lauren on this particular time and the staff member came out from family resources and another woman came out at the same time who I did not know. And she starts tearing up because she was there again. It's a woman's shelter. She had an abusive husband and her and her kids are now living at the shelter. And before she came there, she had a garden. She was able to provide for her kids and couldn't do that anymore. This spark like kind of took her back to the fact that she could now provide this type of thing for her kids again. And man, it just, again, it makes me teary thinking <laughs> about it, but you know, those kinds of stories, you just don't think about like how big of an impact this has. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You usually don't get to see the results of, you know, you're doing all of this and then giving them their deliveries and leaving and you don't always get to know. Well, Lauren, I reached out to those places that you donated to, and I asked them to tell me what, you know, what, what you've done and what you've donated to them has meant. I heard back from a few. So do you mind if I read a couple of these messages to you? Go ahead. <laughs> All right. So the Wheatland Manor, the nursing home, this is what they said. This was Lauren's second year providing fresh vegetables to our residents. It really is a wonderful treat for our residents. We are so grateful to her. And thank you, Lauren, for your generosity. It means a lot. Riverbend Food Bank donated there. They said, we are extremely grateful for Lauren's generosity and commitment to the area food banks. And that was from Nancy Rankis, the president and CEO of Riverbend Food Bank. Not only is she helping our mission of ending hunger, but she demonstrates the selflessness and philanthropy that is so wonderful to see in younger people. And then you mentioned the Cafe on Vine and they said, Laura is awesome. <laughs> We enjoyed meeting her and her siblings as they delivered produce to Cafe on Vine. Our guests love fresh vegetables and nutritional food, and, and nutritional food is best for them. Also, Lauren's donations to the cafe assisted with building our processed vegetables for the long winter ahead. Thanks, Lauren, for your support of Cafe on Vine. Together, we can make a difference in the lives of our guests who visit Cafe on Vine. And then... Two more, <laughs> the community action of Eastern Iowa. So you talked about that one mm -hmm. and they replied back and said, Lauren has made it possible for our consumers to have access to fresh produce three months out of the year. That's exactly what you were trying to do. <laughs> so there you go. Um, access to, to food that supports healthy dietary patterns can lead to lifelong positive health outcomes. Low-income families sometimes lack access to fresh fruits and vegetables due to the fact that these items tend to be more expensive to purchase at convenience stores, supermarkets, and grocery stores. Lauren is truly a remarkable young person who has a vision and the ability to make a significant impact in our community. Community Action of Eastern Iowa would like to thank Lauren for her hard work, and we are excited to see her efforts being recognized. And then Our Lady of the Prairie Retreat. And they said, thanks to Lauren's generous contribution of pumpkins and gourds, we were able to decorate the grounds with multiple harvest themed displays that helped create a warm, welcoming ambiance for our guests to enjoy while they walked the grounds. We are very grateful to Laura, Lauren and her team and hope that her autumn, dis that our autumn displays are in line with what she was hoping to achieve. So if you were wondering, <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know any of that. So that's, yeah. Pretty awesome. Yeah. And the things that they're saying are exactly what you were talking about, the access to food and eating healthy. And so not only that, but those dietary patterns that they're talking about leading to lifelong positive health outcomes. There's a lot here that you're doing, that you're impacting. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah. And so the I don't remember which place it was here that I just read, but you and your siblings were delivering. So did your family, your family was helping you a little bit too? Yeah. So because I donated such large quantities of produce to Cafe on Vine, I couldn't do it by myself. Like I physically <laughs> couldn't pick up all of the tomatoes, I mean potatoes that I would donate because it was just too heavy. She had to take her 14-year-old brother, yeah. who's a football player, <laughs> down to do it. <laughs> yeah. And her, yeah, her sister Natalie's also gone too. So she's 
uh, just a, a helping hand to take things out of the car and inside is awesome. Yeah, sure. Do you have kind of an idea how many hours that you put into everything? Yeah, I roughly have a thousand hours working throughout the past two years of everything in this garden. That's a lot when you're going to school and all the other things that you named off. You're not yeah. just going to high school, but you have other organizations and sports that you're in. Yeah. yeah. Especially during the summer when I'm playing softball and showing sheep and rabbits. I have to work with my sheep and rabbits at least two hours every single day. So I learned how to manage my time management very well throughout the summer, especially the past two years. Sure. That's something I hadn't thought of. I mean, that's something that you're learning too. More than what a lot of us adults do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's been a challenge that you've learned from doing this? Well, one of my challenges was time management, but also the beginning of my project, I was able to use the greenhouse provided by FFA to start my some of the produce. So like lettuce and broccoli and all that. I wanted to get it a plant before I wanted to transfer into the ground. So I started growing stuff in the greenhouse. And then as time went on, I kept watering, kept doing everything I was supposed to. And then the greenhouse overheated. So those plants, <laughs> so those plants died. So I oh, had, no. I just went to farm and play with my mom and bought those plants again. Like it wasn't a huge <laughs> deal, but it was still enough to impact a little bit. I think it was your mom that said, you know, you really are doing this from your heart and we talked about how you've gained recognition, um, you know, new news articles, news TV stations have come and interviewed you. How do you want to use this opportunity to speak about what you've learned regarding access to produce in communities? I've learned that what you're doing impacts way more people than you think it does. No matter how big my, like your project is, it impacts more people than you thought because at first, I thought my garden was only going to impact just a couple people. But then once I finally like saw what it was doing, I'm like, okay, I want to keep going because this is this feels really good. Like I love helping people. So that was just one big thing that I wanted to hit. And Jenna, from the organization, I mean, they've approved her doing this project twice, now three times. You must see some positive reasons to keep supporting yeah so like uh lauren or like we kind of mentioned before lauren's been a two-time national ffa sae grant recipient and then we're uh, running her again this year um, hoping to get a third one from the national ffa those are due um i guess by the time this airs um we'll have results by then outside of just that there are those things in ffa lauren has also kind of shown off some of her record keeping and her project as a whole within a proficiency application within FFA. So this was something, it took all of her records that she has. She had to answer some additional questions, put some pictures in there, put some captions about the project she was doing. And she last year with that, she received um, a gold award at state convention. So she was fourth in the state with that. Congratulations. Honestly, <laughs> honestly I think the biggest thing holding it back was how many records she has at that point. She only had you know, she didn't even have this year's growing season on it. It was just her first year, half acre records on there. So I think that really was the biggest thing holding her back was her application was so young and that's okay. Um, so mm -hmm. we're really excited to submit an application for that again this year and really see how that goes and takes off having a whole other harvest under her belt and then kind of keep building on that in the future years too, to hopefully, hopefully we get a um, state winning proficiency here in a couple of years and maybe make it on the big stage at national convention. So those are some mm -hmm. FFA side goals. Outside of that, she's also applied for um, the Bill of Bill of Rights Institute, My Impact Challenge, which was a new one for all of us. I feel like the contest itself was basically youth and it wasn't within agriculture. It was youth across the country, high school youth. And it was basically just how they were impacting their communities or what different things they were doing. So we did end up getting that submitted. And then again, that was a national contest outside of FFA. And she actually ended up being a, remind me of what exactly it was. It was a special award winner, right? Yeah. Special yeah. award winner. So she was kind of narrowed down as a finalist within that, was interviewed, later was awarded that special award, and I think got $500 for that. So that was really cool. Again, I think the only thing kind of holding her back is her age, not having that much behind it. 
But as we keep going here in the next couple of years, I'm really excited to see how these different opportunities and awards really shake out for her. Congratulations again. Lauren, what advice do you have for people who would want to start something similar? Would you say don't do it? Or would you <laughs> would you have advice to give to them? My advice would be to start smaller and get comfortable to, like for what you're doing. Don't start off huge and not know what you're doing and it end up being a complete fail. You want to see progress throughout your project as you're going throughout the years. So starting small is something that you would need to think about. Sure. And, you know, we're so known in the Midwest to grow gardens and then leave zucchini on the neighbor's doorsteps. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Or tomatoes, they come in to work with you and it's, there's a basket of tomatoes if anybody needs them. So maybe even to rethink where we're giving those, maybe there's other places in our communities that we should think about where we could donate our vegetables. I think that was probably one of the biggest ah ahas that I had too, just as a parent. So year one, Lauren started by donating to five organizations. Year two, she's expanded to eight. Year three, the goal is to go with 10. And then eventually I believe... 12 is the final, I think. So as you just kind of start looking for different food pantries or nonprofits, I was actually pretty shocked. They're pretty much in every town. So we live in the middle of nowhere. And I mean, outside of a town of 200 people, pretty much every town around here has, whether you're a town of 300 people or a thousand or large, like the Quad Cities, I was very surprised how much need there really is. Even just asking your local United Way, they have a lot of good advice too about where to give that yeah. kind of thing. And I think sometimes people might think, because um, it's a perishable food item. So to think mm-hmm. about where you can give a perishable food item too, I suppose there's more organizing. You can't just go drop it off in their mm-hmm. basket they have outside the door or something like that. So yep. yeah. So. This what's this about John Deere? John Deere is going to feature you during National <laughs> FFA Week. Hey, do you work at John Deere? I I do. So I'll I'll just tell you how this came about. So I'm actually um I work in aftermarket and customer support within John Deere, and I lead a volunteer group there. Of there's about 1,200 people that fall under the aftermarket and customer support area. So this past summer we had a conference at headquarters in Moline, Illinois. And it was just for all these people like me who are big volunteers at work. And Mm -hmm. so I went to it and there was one session focused on this topic. So just the, the need for food and, you know, the scarcities and all that good stuff. And one of the panelists on there was Riverbend Food Bank, who oddly enough, we don't, (laughs) we donate to. So it was an awesome session. So following that session, I emailed the people that put it on and the moderator who I knew and just told them, Hey, this session was great. If you're thinking about this conference next year, do it again. And personally, here's why I find it really cool. Here's what my, my daughter's doing. So I just mentioned it kind of casually. They came back. And so it was our like corporate citizenship group and said, okay, this is amazing. Like you need to start mention this to the press or something. And by the way, we want to feature this come National FFA week in February. We want to feature Lauren because this is such a cool giving project. And so, you know, my first thought was, yeah, are you kidding? You know, so like, I think John Deere has like 5 million followers or something on Facebook alone. So, I mean, that's how that all went down and we'll see. I mean, they're, they're pretty serious about doing it. So I, I mean, that's huge exposure just for, again, like a a small town Iowa farm kid. (laughs) So, yeah. Yeah. But that's what the world is made up of, right? People like that. And obviously, Katie, Lauren's learned even from watching you then you're serving in this capacity at your workplace. But it sounds to me like your whole family is, you, you know, how to give back to the community. Yeah, um, I think it's in my blood truly because my parents did a lot of this type of thing too so it was almost like if you they saw something that was needed in the community they were one of the first people to step in and do it so yeah again I just feel like it's been in my blood and it just went through to her too Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
So we talked about how you're involved in a lot of activities. And I was just wondering, like, are there times where you have just felt like, okay, that's I, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to do this again. Have you ever felt like just giving up? I haven't felt like giving up, but it's been, it's been frustrating sometimes because as a kid, you want to go hang out with your friends. You want to go do this. You want to go do that. You don't want to wake up. You can go places, but you have to. Like (laughs) when I had softball on the weekends, I had to water my garden before my softball tournament. So that was at like six o'clock in the morning. For three hours. (laughs) Yes. And then I'd go, I'd go to softball, get in the Suburbans, we would drive there. I would come back and then I would have to work with my animals. So I just, I didn't want to do it. But then once I realized like, you can't just not stop helping people. Like that's just not a thing in my world. So I had to keep, I had to keep going because I knew that people were counting on me to get them produce. And I didn't want to stop just because I didn't want to do it. Like I wanted to keep doing it. Jenna and Katie, what, what have you learned from Lauren? How does she inspire you or how have you seen her inspire others? Um, I think I see her inspire others in the classroom just because that's my, you know, main area of contact with her is in the classroom. So I really see that, especially kind of working with freshmen and kind of gaining ideas of, okay, what does what does this kid want their um SAE or supervised agriculture experience to be? You know, I always I always find myself kind of going back to Lauren's of, you know. You could do this as a traditional, you know, you show animals at the county fair, but that doesn't mean that has to be what your SAE Mm -hmm. is. I often bring her up in the classroom of, you know, if you want to add on to it and really make something and make a difference, you know, taking this community service aspect of it is really inspiring. So I think her story, especially here at the local level, really does get out. And I think that her passion aside from that, and, you know, it's, it's different seeing someone on the news and hearing about that story. That's completely different than that person sitting next to you in ag leadership. Like that just makes so much more difference being there in person with that person. So I think that that's really inspiring, I think, to me and all the students that go to Calma Sweetland. I'd say for me, I mean, it's truly been like the last month or so whenever this first hit the press that it, things have just kind of gone viral and I'll tell you what, opening MSN and seeing your daughter standing there with the greenhouse is a little odd, but I'll tell you, (laughs) I mean, reading through some of these social media posts, there were comments, literally thousands, I mean, pushing probably a hundred thousand comments from people. And you read through all of these, 99% of them were positive. And there were people that just kind of I mean, they've reached out to Jenna, they reached out to, to me and just said, you know, you've inspired me to start my own garden. You've inspired me for this reason. And I didn't see that coming at all. So, you know, I think just, I think my main story and just kind of how she's inspired, inspired me is like young people can make a difference. And we've heard it from thousands of people and you know, just, it might seem like a small gesture, but in reality, it's really made a a true difference in our communities. I think if you were, if you were to track this project and its publicity, um, obviously getting the grants and having that national recognition, recognition, um, the story was always kind of out there. I think that the, my impact challenge was kind of a turning point too, when people started picking up on the project, on the, on her project more. Um, But I really think that news interview that Lauren did about a month ago really kind of spun things out of control from there, for lack of a better term. Um, From there, I think it just kind of went crazy. And, you know, other news stations picked it up from there all across the world, all across the country. We had we did an interview a couple of weeks ago with a lady out in New York. Um, We have this podcast with you here. I mean, you're based out of Minnesota. I got a Facebook message when I checked my phone right before this started. And there was another Facebook message in our uh, chapter, our chapter Facebook group from somebody from the Washington Post. So, so wow. add, that, add that one to your list. <laughs> what the um, so, I mean, it just kind of, it, it all just kind of keeps, keeps building on one another. And I think it's really cool to be able to share Lauren's story and to be a part of it too. I think a lot of it is Lauren, because you are so young. I I don't think that we give enough credit to younger people. And especially when you're in high school about all the things that you can do to impact for good in this world. And 
not only that, but those of us who have gardened or ever attempted to garden, <laughs> we know how much work it is to just do a small garden and growing a garden and growing food is something you have to pay attention to no matter whether you feel like it or not. So the commitment that you've put into this is worthwhile. And I think why people are really recognizing it and you deserve that. Speaking of vegetables, I asked you guys about recipes. And so I get to share, Lauren, your favorite is the fried green beans. And yeah. So we'll share that. I love fried green beans, although you do some butter, which I do butter, but I add a little bacon grease. <laughs> <laughs> Probably shouldn't tell people that, but there's always a little bacon fat in there. But it looks to me like you just, you wash them, cut the ends off, put in some butter and Oh, you, but you put a little bit of the Lowry season salt. I like that. Oh, and bacon yeah. bits. I didn't notice that part. You have bacon bits in there. <laughs> you like them black. And so I do too. I like them when they get yes. blistered, a little bit crispy. Yes. And Katie, you have homemade spaghetti sauce with, I yeah. mean, you guys had a thousand pounds of fresh tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Katie, like you have homemade spaghetti sauce. 1100 with pounds. But I mean, again, before this garden came about, I'd done this for a long time. So just anybody, like you said, who grows tomatoes, you have like a plethora at once. And so like either you freeze them or you make something like this. And so a homemade spaghetti sauce with fresh tomatoes. So it takes up a whole bunch. I mean, this particular recipe is four pounds worth. I don't even remember since we have the scale that Lauren uses for the garden, I just weigh them and follow mm -hmm. the recipe, but it's very simple. It takes two hours at the most. And yeah, typically I, I double this recipe for one pound of spaghetti. So again, good flavors. You got the onions, garlic, some typical types of seasonings like basil and parsley. And, you know, the big thing is just kind of simmering it for one to two hours. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's good. I've never frozen it or anything like that because usually we oh. eat it right away. <laughs> sure. Well, I was going to ask if you've ever, if you can it, but I suppose you could <laughs> following the right I, process. I don't know. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I can a lot of other stuff like um, the kids like pickles and I freeze a lot of stuff. So tomatoes mm -hmm. are frozen a ton. Um, I freeze a lot of onions, peppers, but haven't ventured down the path to do this one. How do you freeze tomatoes? Um, you basically just drop them in boiling water and then blanch them. So drop, take them till the skin starts to just get a little bit of uh, wrinkle for mm -hmm. my professional assessment. That's here. what I would say too. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> it starts to wrinkle in like uh, two to three minutes and then you drop it right into ice and then take the skin off. And then I just kind of break them up with a fork and then freeze them right there. So oh, okay. use yeah. Take them out in the winter and use them in chili. I use them in lasagna, uh, goulash, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And and you could take and just make the spaghetti sauce then from the frozen yeah. tomatoes, right? Okay. Correct. Yep. Good. Well, these look really good. So I'll post those on the blog. Thank you for sharing those. I'm I'm happy mm -hmm. about those. So we're kind of we're coming to an end here. Lauren, what do you love most about what you've accomplished? I know you're very humble and I can tell. <laughs> and at some point you'd be like, enough with the press already. <laughs> what I've loved most about this project is just seeing people's reactions to when I drop off the produce, how happy they are about just a teenager going out and donating her time towards growing produce and giving it back to people. That's what I love most about it. As you get older and move into different stages and things of your life, I'm sure you'll find ways to give back no matter what it is. So what's next for you? You'll continue this into, for now anyway, you have plans for 2024 and then 2025. Beyond that I, though, you'll be off to college or something maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So I plan on expanding, like I talked about expanding my garden to two acres. Then my goal is to donate 20,000 pounds of produce by like my fourth year of my SAE. And then I want to donate to 12 to 15 nonprofit organizations around Eastern Iowa. After my garden, I will, I plan on going into the medical field. I want to be a sonographer. So it's okay. not just based on agriculture right now. Like I want to do something completely different, but I will still help people no matter where I am. 
We've also kicked around the idea of potentially registering in Iowa for a 501c3 nonprofit status. And the reason being not so much last year, but just after this year where, again, Lauren's proven this is going to be successful and she's going to stick with it and all that good stuff. We've had a lot of people just ask about donating. And I, I don't know, I, I get a little hesitant with just doing all of that. But I think if you set up a nonprofit status, you're eligible to apply for different grants outside of just FFA. Yeah. So, you know, we're kicking around that at this point to maybe go that path the next two years. And again, just to kind of help with the funding and not totally rely on FFA because those, those grants aren't guaranteed whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And if you got enough of grants, you know, you could get a bigger hose for your watering tanks. (laughs) (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Well, what do you guys most want people to know? We'll just end it with that. If you all three want to speak to that or whoever, but what do you most want people to know? I would want people to know that I have goals for the future and I set goals to make sure that they are done. So for the next two years, when I am doing this essay, I want to make sure that I am donating this certain amount of produce to this many places and no matter what, because next year I want to double crop my garden. So after I harvest lettuce or um, broccoli, they just, they don't grow back. The plant is done. So after that, I want to grow the, after I harvest, I want to grow the plant in the ground again, and then have another like row of lettuce and broccoli. So it, it doubles the amount of lettuce I have, but I'm still reaching my goal. I'm making more for people. Yeah. So I, I, I'm kind of thinking a little more high level, um, just kind of what I want people to know. So I mean, just personally and through work and stuff, I'm involved with a lot of nonprofits just currently and in the past. And so I've heard, I've got a lot of education on this topic, just kind of, like I said, high level. So I know people thought during the pandemic, the need for fresh produce and food in general would spike and it did. And then I know people also thought post pandemic, the need would subside some and it did not. So basically with inflation that happened, even post pandemic, the need is actually greater than it's ever been. So that's not just for fresh produce, but that's just food in general. So I know I mentioned this earlier, but as we looked into new places to donate to for new prof- new nonprofits in Eastern Iowa, like I said, nearly every town had something set up and it is in the need. So like I said, I think it's just a bit of misconception that once this COVID pandemic eased, that would come down. And in reality, it's been the opposite. And so I I don't think a lot of people know that. So the need is there and it's not just the fresh produce. So if you don't have a a way or means to donate that way or give, there's always the correct non-perishable or financial donations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 If you can't give monetarily, absolutely give your time. Mm-hmm. If you want to cut and pull weeds, we will not turn you away. <laughs> <laughs> the middle of Iowa is not hard to find. <laughs> Jenna, did you want to say anything here at the end that you want people to know? Oh, yeah, I guess I I feel like a lot of the times we often get down on young people. We often think, you know, well, those kids, all they care about is doing sports or they actually don't really want to work. They just want to, you know, make money in the end. And I think Lauren puts both of those both of those things to shame like that's not what Lauren's doing this based off of she's doing this project based off of her heart um she's doing it based off she's she's not getting anything for this and it's all coming from her heart so I think that Lauren's story really just kind of keeps faith in that in those young people and that there are young people and teenagers um high schoolers that are willing to work and make a difference um we just have to go out and find them so I think it's kind of one of those lighthearted stories of you know the world the world isn't all bad there is a lot of good in the world. Um, and I think the most important thing is to be the good. If you can't find the good, be the good. I hope that I, I'll have a way to keep in touch with you guys. I'd love to see what you do for, for the 2024 and 2025. And Yeah, feel free to follow Feel free to follow uh, the Calmus Wheel and FFA page on Facebook or Instagram. Well, Lauren, Katie, Jenna, thank you very much for joining me today and sharing this wonderful story. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. 
Great news, Lauren was awarded a $1,000 FFA SAE grant for her project this summer. And they followed through with that Washington Post article, so I've linked to that in the show notes, and it's also on randomsweets.com, along with the photos and recipes from today. I hope Lauren's story has inspired you to find your way of giving back to the community. You know, maybe we don't plant veggies on two acres of land, but just think how much you'll brighten someone's day when you just simply cut a pretty bouquet of flowers from your garden next summer and deliver them to your local senior living center or domestic violence shelter. Thank you for pressing play today. This was a fun and inspiring way to kick off our new year. Tune in next time to learn how the Huron South Dakota School District is placing an emphasis on farm to school by incorporating lots of fresh and local ingredients in their school lunches, which, by the way, they're making those from scratch, (laughs) by partnering with farmers, ranchers, and producers in their area. If you're new here, I hope you subscribe or follow Funeral Potatoes and Wool Mittens. Sending you good vibes in the new year, I'm your host, Stacey Mergenthal. Sweet wishes!